Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour, wherever you are and however you're tuning in. We're so glad you're here. We hope you had a wonderful week walking and talking with Jesus. Do you know that Jesus covers us with his life? Mm -hmm. His blood heals our pains makes our sins white as snow. And that is what our first song talks about. Hymn 412, covered with his life. This comes as a request from Bothwell in Little Elm, Texas. Thank you for that. We'll sing uh, the first three verses of Hymn 412. And to know Jesus holds out a robe white as snow. Lord, I accept it. We must accept it. Amen. Leaving my own, gladly I wear thy pure life alone. Amen. If you have a special request, please visit us at our website at saccentral.org. Click on the contact us link and tell us where you're from. We're continuing to move through the hymnal with new themes uh, every couple of months. Choose one and we'll sing them with you. Our last song in honor of our springtime and a very special spring concert this afternoon at Sacramento Central. Let's sing hymn 93 in the theme in the topical index of power of God in nature. All things bright and beautiful, hymn 93. Let's sing the first three verses.
Heavenly Father, for the beauty of the earth, we are so thankful. All things bright and beautiful, all things wise, you created them. Thank you, Lord, for creating us with love and for always showering us with your blessings. Uh, we ask that your blessings be with us now as we continue in the writings of Peter. Bless Pastor Michael Butler, and we ask you in your precious loving name, amen. Our lesson study this morning will be brought to us by our associate pastor at Sac Central Church, Pastor Michael Butler. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Uh, welcome to you, both here in the studio audience and those of you who are tuning in online, uh, live stream. Uh, we want to welcome you as well. You know, it's always a pleasure uh, to be here. And I, every once in a while, I get to have the honor uh, and pleasure to study with you uh, God's Word. And um, it's always a high Sabbath for me. I hope it is for you. Um, and... I hope it is for you as well online. And I don't want to forget that we have a offer, um, the offer number C21720. That is offer number C21720. And if you call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org, you can get uh, today's um, message uh, this morning. Um, also, don't forget to put your name in there so we know who to send it to and uh, whether, you're not, whether or not you want a CD or DVD. All right, why don't we get right into our lesson study for this morning. Uh, we're going into lesson number eight. Moving on, lesson number eight. This one's a little bit different than some of the other ones. Um, uh, it's titled, Jesus in the Writing of Peter. So, again... Uh, it's a little bit different than some of the other ones uh, that we've studied together so far. So why don't we start with our lesson, uh, our memory text in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says this, Who himself bore our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. Amen that is right. Uh, when, I was, when I was young, or I, I mean, I consider myself young, so when I was younger, I'll say, I'll say that. <laughs> when I was younger, I was a huge fan of, of Michael Jordan. Maybe you, you've heard of him before. I grew up in, in his heyday. Um, a huge Chicago Bulls fan, uh, but I was a huge fan of Michael Jordan, and uh, I would try to watch as many games as possible. And uh, I drew pictures, and some of you know that I like to I like the arts, the fine arts. So I would try to draw pictures and 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 paint, and you know I purchased uh, posters, you know at the local store where you got those rolls, right? Got those long rolls and you roll them out and put them on your, on your wall. I purchased posters. I tried even to play like him. And if you've watched him play, he was really good. Um, I also had basketball cards. I collected basketball cards from uh, over the years, uh, upwards of 150 of them. And even I had some baseball cards when he retired for the first time. Uh, in between his first and second season. Um, in seventh grade, in my writing class, you know, I was trying to remember what my teacher's name was, and I couldn't remember her name. But she was one of my favorite teachers, so it was surprising to me. But when I was in seventh grade, uh, in my writing class, uh, we were tasked to, to write about um, some of our favorite things. And so I decided to write about the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. And, you know, I talked about how I wanted to play like him. I wanted to fly through the air and stick my tongue out and dunk and all of these things. And, of course, I was about, you know, four foot two, um, very short um, <laughs> in seventh grade. But uh, so the, the, the dunking was, uh, was uh, uh, something that was a dream very far off. But that's what you do when you, you care about something, when you admire someone, when you 
when you look up to someone, you write about them, you write about it, whatever it might be. So when you really care about that person, when you look up to them, you write about them. And uh, there's an old adage that says, uh, it's nothing to write home about. And the point here is that if there was something significant, you would write about it, right? And so I did, you know, um, or at least what I cared about. But so did Peter. And that's what we're going to get into this morning. Peter wrote consistently about Jesus. He wrote to whomever, whomever he uh, who would listen to him. He was so enamored with Jesus and what he did for him. He wrote, uh, mentioning him by name, uh, over 50 times in two epistles, First and Second Peter, using the words Lord, Jesus, or Christ, um, 50, 50 plus times. You know, that's, that's a lot. That's more than Hebrews, actually. And there's only, it's only about, what, uh, maybe nine chapters in total in those two, ver- those two books. And uh, you would think Paul, who's talking about Jesus in, in Hebrews, would mention him a little bit more. But uh, actually, Peter says Jesus uh, many more times. And of course, there are many more times that Peter actually mentioned him indirectly in these two epistles. And our scripture, or rather our memory text, was an example of that. So Peter talked about Jesus. He, he thought about Jesus. He wrote about Jesus many, many times. And that's what you do when you admire someone. That's what you do when you look up to them, when you love them. And so this lesson, we are going to see what Peter had to say about Jesus in his epistles. And I hope you see the Jesus that Peter loved. And I hope we can all fall in love with Peter's Jesus again. Let's, um, let's transition to Sunday's lesson uh, titled, Jesus, Our Sacrifice. Jesus, Our Sacrifice. And I'm gonna, I've got a couple pages here that I'm going to be flipping, so don't mind me. Okay, let's read uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 together. And when, you're, when you get there, uh, go ahead and give me a hearty amen. 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 Two of you are there. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. Reading again from the New King James. It says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. These are some lofty, lofty themes here in this verse um, that are played out here. Uh, one, of course, being the concept or the subject of redemption. And the other, the sacrifice uh, through shed blood. And so uh, we're going to look at redemption briefly. And of course, you know this, redemption uh, can be used in various forms and has been used in various forms uh, depending on the context. But the way that Peter uses it here in this verse uh, in these verses, uh, was to really paint the picture of a transaction. So if we look at this again in verse 18, Peter says, knowing you, of course, who is he talking about? He's talking to the people uh, in verse 1, right? Those that were in uh, Cappadocia, uh, Bithynia, um, Asia. These, these five locations mentioned in verse 1. He's saying you were not redeemed or bought back, there's this transaction, with corruptible things. And what were those corruptible things? Silver and gold, right? You were redeemed from your aimless conduct. And the the lesson study actually uses a different um, translation. It says, futile ways inherited by your fathers, or rather from your fathers. But they were not bought back with silver and gold, okay? They were not bought back with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And, um, you know, to redeem them, to buy them back, it was the laying down of Christ's life. That's what Peter is emphasizing here. Peter also uses the sacrificial language of lamb without spot and without blemish to describe the type of redemption it was. Or really how this redemption or buying back was made complete. It was made complete through the life of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb. 
So Peter knew well this sacrificial system, right? Uh, it wasn't that many days removed from the writing of this, these epistles that Jesus had died, right? That they were still sacrificing, and even until uh, they were still sacrificing at this point in time. So he was there on one of the biggest nights, one of the biggest feasts of the year when a lamb was offered on that Passover weekend. So redemption is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. The plan of redemption, the plan of salvation is a major theme in Scripture. And for Peter, rightfully so. But I want to get into the kind of the relationship that Peter has with this this truth. For Peter, it was more than just a doctrinal uh, principle. It was more than a process. It was more than just a theological truth. It was life for Peter. When thinking of Jesus, what Jesus means to him, I'm sure, and, and maybe you have the same kind of thought process that I do, you can't help but go back and remind, be reminded of when Christ was about to be crucified. And in the wee hours of, of the morning on that uh, preparation day, the cock crows and Peter had denied his Lord. You can't help but, but be reminded of the, the afternoon when Jesus gave up his last breath. One can't help but to be reminded that and, and feel for Peter in that moment, in those moments as you read this scripture, Peter really believed that the blood of Christ was precious. It was precious to him. In it was life, and Peter understood that it was his sin that put Jesus on that tree. It was also intensely personal for Peter. He was forever grateful for what Jesus had done for him. It wasn't enough to be bought back with earthly wealth. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I think there's, there's something to that when Peter says it was not by silver or, or gold, these corruptible things, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He felt it personally and intensely what Jesus had done for him. Can you see that? So he understood, at least to a certain degree, um, when Christ was actually uh, on the cross, but he understood it more fully later on. We'll get into that. Um, but Peter, even though he had just denied him, like Peter, we ought to uh, make it personal. And I guess it begs the question this morning, do we have that same appreciation as Peter for being bought back, for being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? What do you say? Well, um, let's, let's continue to move on in our lesson study. Um, we're going to tarry a little bit here on Monday and, and Tuesday here. I'm going to also go into Monday's lesson titled The Passion of the Christ. Okay. I think I've got a little confused here with my stuff here. <laughs> Okay, so when you think of, of passion, the word passion, what, what is your, one of your first thoughts? You likely think about, you know, a strong emotional uh, feeling, right, um, uh, towards someone or something. But when you think of the passion of the Christ, you might think of something a little bit differently, right? We've seen the movie, I'm sure. Uh, maybe some of you haven't, I don't know. But... When you think of passion or the passion of the Christ, uh, you're likely, inevitably, your mind kind of veers off to this, the final periods in, in Jesus' life, right? When he was, uh, from the beginning of the shouts of Hosanna, when he's coming into Jerusalem, right? Until his death on the cross. This is the time frame that people typically think about when they hear the passion of the Christ, and actually, the word passion uh, comes in the Greek actually means to suffer. Um, and so it's fitting that it refers to this suffering in the last days of his life here on earth. Um, we're going to go into the, the reading for Monday's lesson. And the reading comes from 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. And I think we've got someone. Okay. All right. Mike, go ahead. For even hereunto were ye called, 
because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. Thank you, Mike. So when you think of, of suffering, and we think of the suffering during this time in Christ's life, and the suffering that he endured, we can hardly look forward to this type of suffering. I, I would imagine that many of you are not um, raising your hand in the line of suffering and saying, you know, let me be next, right? Um, you know, but I want to bring us back, though, to what he's actually talking about. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not fully convinced that Peter is actually talking about the suffering that Christ had to endure that we must endure. And before you, your mind starts to run with what I mean by that, let me, let me clarify with, with the word. Let's go back to those verses uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. And I'm actually going to start in verse 20, if I could find it. Some of these Bibles have really thin pages. You skip like 20. Okay. I think we've got it here. All right. First Peter chapter 2, um, starting in verse 20. First Peter 2, verse 20, says this, But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. And then he, and then he continues in verse 21, To this... Referring to what was just stated, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you. So in other words, uh, this, this suffering that, that Peter is, is referring to is a suffering for doing good and you take it patiently. He's not saying you don't, it's okay to suffer for doing evil. That's not the same thing, right? He's talking about this suffering that, that you endure for doing something good, for doing God's will. And, and, and if you think about it in that context, this is exactly what Jesus did. He came to do his Father's will, and he suffered for it. And um, I think this is what Peter is essentially talking about here. Um, I don't think that it's, it's the expectation of, for us to have to go through and endure the same type of physical uh, suffering that Jesus did. It doesn't mean, though, that we should expect not to suffer for Jesus, right? We shouldn't expect not to suffer for him um, if, principally, we will, are going to walk with him and do his will, right? So um, in verse 20, this principle is, is that it is commendable for us to do good and take it patiently, and this is what we are called to do. Does that make sense? Okay, you know, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have actually suffered for trying to do good. And I don't know if you've heard of the, the Good Samaritan Law. Um, and if, if you have, you know what I mean. Um, but, but Peter is connecting this suffering for doing good and taking it patiently with the Christian life. This is the example that he's referring to. This is the example that we must look for in Christ, that we must also um, uh, partake in the Christian life. You know, so if, if we love our Redeemer, if we love our Lord, we will rejoice at every opportunity to share with him, with him, not just, not just to go through suffering for suffering's sake, but to share in his humiliation, in the shame and, repro and reproach in Christ. Otherwise, it's in vain, right? So the love that we have for our Lord makes this type of suffering, for his sake, it makes it sweet. It makes it, uh, uh, what's the word? 
I'll just leave it at sweet. And we know that if this suffering, the suffering that we uh, suffer with him, we shall also, and the promise is that we shall also reign with him, amen, in his glory. So this experience of Christ's uh, uh, suffering for Christ's sake uh, is absolutely essential to the spiritual life of the Christian. There can be no true vital holiness uh, without seasons of trial and grief. That's just the way that it is. Uh, we are chosen in the furnace of affliction, and the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. What do you say? Amen. That is right. This, of course, is not to belittle the suffering of Christ and what he had to do to en endure for our sake. Uh, actually, one of my favorite quotes, quotes from my favorite author outside of the Bible says that we ought to spend a thoughtful hour on these closing scenes of Christ's life. We're to meditate on these things. So we should try to comprehend the wonders of this, of this amazing sacrifice. And we should dwell on the marvelous love of our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, till our stony hearts are melted in contrition and gratitude. So the love that stored his own heart enabled him, the spotless Lamb of God, to become an offering for the guilty. For you and I, for the transgressor, to, for the transgressor of his father's law. Love stored his own heart to enable him to do that. It sustained him in his purpose to save the fallen race, you and I, and our heartless ingratitude and scorn. Love strengthened him for temptation, reproach, torture, poverty, shame, and death. Love can do the same for you and I. Amen? As we suffer for his namesake, love for our Redeemer will subdue and soften even the hardest of hearts. And maybe even to say, falling at his feet, as, as Thomas did in, in John 20, my Lord and my God. This is how, we, how he was able to suffer and really how Peter was able to suffer um, for doing good. And we also have that, that opportunity to follow in his steps, suffering for our Savior, for our Lord, for doing good and taking it patiently. For doing good and taking it patiently. Doing his will for our Savior. And of course, uh, as the scripture states, Jesus, he didn't revile back, you know. He didn't return, you know, lash for lash. He, he turned away. And I think when we think about that, it's kind of hard to do. And I'm reminded of, of um, many times as I was growing up, um, maybe you had family and, and friends that were uh, aggressive like my, my family and friends. Uh, and, and a lot of young boys uh, were... Uh, how should I say, rambunctious. We, I was always getting in, in wrestling and, and fighting with my friends and pushing my brother and all this kind of stuff. And, and um, you know, when I think about not reviling back, that was a foreign thing for me, you know. Uh, hitting someone back was just, okay, well, they hit me, I'm going to hit them, right? And that's just not the way of a Christian. That's not the way of, of, of Christ, and, um, and so it, it's, it takes some learning for each of us because we want to lash back at someone for, for hurting us, for, for suffering. Even for doing good, we want to lash out. And, uh, but that's not the way the Lord uh, has taught us, and that's not how we follow in his footsteps. Okay. Moving on. We're on um, Tuesday's lesson. Tuesday's lesson, the resurrection of Jesus according to Peter. And I, I put according to Peter because all of this is really according to Peter, right? First and second Peter. Um, but it gives us some insight on what he thinks or what he thought about uh, Jesus as the resurrection and um, also Jesus as our sacrifice. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll tie this all together uh, towards the end. Okay. Tuesday's lesson, um, we're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 1. So hopefully you haven't turned your pages too far, and you're right there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to read those. 
It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. How many of you like to eat? Only one of you, two of you. <laughs> okay. You don't look starved, though, so you must like to enjoy to eat. <laughs> I love to eat. And, you know, I don't get uh, to eat out much. Um, and I don't get to eat a whole lot on Sabbath because I'm uh, sometimes busy. But I love to eat. And one of my favorite things to do is eat good food. <laughs> I don't mean overeat. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm not saying overeat. I'm just saying I love to eat. Um, so it uh, looks like I have two witnesses here this morning. But I can also see through the portals of this broadcast that there are people out there that are raising their hands saying I love to eat too. So thank you for that as well. Um, but uh, when, I, when I want to eat good food sometimes, what do you do? If you're maybe a little bit tired uh, maybe you order in, or maybe you go out to a restaurant. And, uh, but before you do that, what do you have to do? If it's a nicer restaurant, what do you have to do? You gotta, you gotta pick up the phone and say, hey, look, I'd like to make a reservation. I'd like to make, make a reservation for two, for my wife and I, okay? They say, okay, sure, uh, what time are you gonna be here? You know, you go through all that. So you make a reservation. And what does that reservation mean, you know, wh when you're going to the, the restaurant? It means that when you get there, they'll have a spot for you, right? <laughs> You're not going to go there and they say, oh, sorry. Um, you know, you, uh, you, I know you made a reservation, but we've, we're all full. So we're sorry about that. Um, maybe that's happened to you. It hasn't happened to me. But the idea there with, with a reservation is that when you call and make a reservation, when you get there, they've got a spot for you, right? <laughs> they'll call your name, uh, butler table for two, right? Um, but... This is what's, what's so interesting about this particular verse. And at the end of um, verse 4, it says that this incorruptible and undefiled uh, inheritance that does not fade away is reserved in heaven for you. Amen? That's pretty awesome. That means that it's there for you. You just got to show up. Just like if you make a reservation to your, your favorite restaurant, if you don't show up, they can't do anything about it. You know, they can't give you the, the food that, that you were going to order. And they, they, they've got this, this empty seat for you, right? Jesus has this, these, this seat, this spot for just you. Amen? Isn't that awesome? He's got a spot for you in heaven. And he says, it's reserved. It's, it's taken up. No one else can take your spot. You just got to show up. Right. Amen? Amen? And I, I really love that. I love that concept of of reservations. But um, anyway, um, we've got a reservation in heaven for us. And our hope of living in heaven has been reserved by Christ through his death and resurrection. So reservations have taken on a new meaning. So next time I call, you know, whatever it is, um, Olive Garden or something, <laughs> you know, I'll be thinking about Jesus and, and what he's done for me. Amen. <laughs> so the reservation really is a guarantee that we will have a place at the table. It's a guarantee that we'll have a place at the table. Our names have been recorded and our place has been reserved. Indeed, Jesus' resurrection, resurrection from the dead is a guarantee that we also can be raised. It doesn't fade away. It reminds me of that song, Our Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. You know, this verse, verse 5 actually continues, and I'm going to go from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 and 4. I'm going to read verse 5 here. So if you're there, and I know you are, it says this, Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept by the power of God, His righteousness through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What this meant for Peter and for us is firstly, everything hinges on Jesus. It doesn't hinge on you. It's not anything that you do. It hinges on Jesus. Amen? That's good news. 
It's not based off of your efforts or, or the things that you do. Of course, you do have to do something. <laughs> but it hinges on Jesus. It hinges on his death, life, death, and resurrection. Secondly, since he has been raised, we can be raised also. One person actually thinks that's awesome. Amen. That's right. <laughs> be encouraged, friends. If you have a loved one who has passed on to sleep in the grave, there is hope. Joy does come in the morning, that glorious morning when Christ shall appear in all his glory to embrace all those who have suffered for him and have hoped in his appearing by faith in his resurrection. I hope that encourages you. I know it encourages me. I've got family. I've got friends like many of you who have, who have fallen asleep. And um, I look forward to the day where I can see them again. And um, I'm preparing myself to see them and to see my Lord and Savior. I hope you are doing the same. Okay, moving on. Wednesday's lesson. Um, Jesus as the Messiah. Of course, this is again in the context of what Peter thinks, what his view is, what he has learned between the death of Christ on the cross to, to now, what he has learned through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, Wednesday's lesson, Jesus as the Messiah. So, you know, the word Messiah um, actually is only in the New Testament twice. I don't know if you knew that, and they're both in the book of John. So Messiah or Messias, the Greek version of Messiah, isn't, um, isn't in 1 Peter or 2 Peter. But the concept is there. Um, many of you know that uh, the word Christ means anointed, right? And the word Messiah in Hebrew actually means the anointed one. So there's, this is a, uh, a, a Hebrew version. Peter is using a Hebrew, uh, or rather a Greek version of the Hebrew word anointed um, in Christ. When he calls him the Christ, he's essentially saying he believes that he is the Messiah or the anointed one. Okay? So Peter is taking that Hebrew word, the Greek version, and to describe Jesus as the Messiah. So Peter himself said, and if you remember in Matthew 16, 16, he says, when, when Christ asked him, who do you think I am? He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So he obviously believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, to what extent, you know, we can, we can understand uh, kind of what he thought at that particular time. Obviously, he didn't have a full and complete understanding of who Christ was was or who the Christ was and what he was about. Um, so let's look at what Peter, um, where he got some of his information. Actually, we're not going to look at all those, those uh, Old Testament uh, texts on the Messiah. All of them or each of them uh, in those passages, when they use the word anointed, it is used in reference to a person who was or is set apart or consecrated for a special work by the Lord or was ordained by the Lord to a position in office, okay? So it could simply mean also blessed. So Peter's understanding might have been limited at this time, and as a matter of fact, many people did not fully understand the, the role and responsibility and the duty of the Messiah, Jesus. Right? Can you agree? Many people didn't understand why he was coming and what he came to do. That's why they misunderstood uh, his, his death. They thought he was coming to uh, you know, make them rulers over, over Rome and uh, take them out of the, the, um, being under the, the leadership of the Roman Empire. So there was obviously a misunderstanding there. And uh, Peter didn't understand what the work of the Messiah and what he came to accomplish so why would he call Jesus Messiah? Why would he call him the Christ? I believe simply that he knew that he was set apart. He was a consecrated. He could see that in Jesus' life. He was consecrated by God. But also, as we've seen in Matthew 16, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there was this, this 
his experience and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to allow him to, to see who Jesus was. Again, he didn't fully understand his work and what he came to do. So Peter lacked that understanding. Um, and of course, by the time he wrote this, first and second Peter, he had a clear understanding of what Jesus uh, was, his, his work and responsibility was, and all that he would accomplish for us, for you and I, for humanity. So what is it that Christ came to do? So far, we've seen it in, in our lesson from, from Sabbath to, to, to now, to Tuesday, uh, through Tuesday. Uh, so far, we've seen Peter describe Jesus as our sacrifice, right? This is what the Messiah came to do. He, be, he came to be the sacrifice, not the one to take them out of the, under the, the yoke of, and bondage of, of Rome, but he came to be their sacrifice. So Peter is, is showing in 1 Peter what, what the Messiah really is. So he came to be their sacrifice. He came to be their hope, their, uh, through faith, through the resurrection. We can have, a, again, a reservation in heaven for you and I, right? So we're able, then, of course, through this, we are able to suffer because he suffered for you and I. All of these things were in contradiction to what people believed at that time. They didn't believe that Jesus, you know, Jesus was the Christ. And if he was, he didn't come to do this. Of course, the Messiah didn't come to do all of these things. To die on the cross? Of course, that's preposterous. So I wonder if we have a misconception of the Messiah, of the word Messiah. And, and maybe we've lost out on the blessing of knowing Jesus as Messiah, the great deliverer, the great redeemer of our sin. Hope that is something that we ponder as we move forward into Thursday's lesson. Um, Thursday's lesson ex actually expands on this idea of, of Messiah into the, into the realm of divine Messiah, okay? So it expands our understanding of Messiah and really for Peter, his own understanding of who Jesus actually is, who the Christ is. So for Peter, he was more than just Messiah. He's more than just a consecrated, more than just a, a set apart individual. Peter believed Jesus to be the divine Messiah, the Lord, God himself. So in both epistles, um, Peter uses language to define Christ more than just a consecrated person, but a divine being with a purpose. Of course, we can see this in the plan of salvation or the plan of, of redemption, right? So actually, towards the beginning of each of these epistles, he lets the reader know who Jesus is. And actually, we're going to look at one of those. And I think we've got a, a reader for, for one of them. I'm going to read 1 Peter 1.3, and then we'll have someone read 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. So as soon as I'm done, we'll go into the next, the next verse. Okay. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from, excuse me, from the dead. Okay. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter here attributes to Jesus the office of Messiah, right? He's already done that. He also attributes in this particular verse, 1-1, one, one, the, the office of Savior or Redeemer. Okay? And he also attributes to Jesus... The, the title of God or Lord, right? He says this, and I'm going to repeat. Um, you did a great job reading. I'm just going to repeat it here. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is Redeemer, Savior. He is God. All of these things. 
So Peter obviously has a, a fuller understanding of Messiah and is, has extended to a divine title, a divine um, uh, authorship. Like, that's who Jesus is. He is God. That's pretty awesome. This tells me so much about who God is. Doesn't it tell you? It tells me that, that of the love that Jesus has, of the love that God has for you and I. To me, it just, it just is saturated with, with that, saturated with love. It tells me so much about Jesus, God and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, a divine being himself, made himself susceptible to death. And not just any death, one of the worst kinds in history. He made himself susceptible to death to ransom you and I. To ransom you and I back with a chance of losing his own life. He is God and he is willing to die for his creation. (laughs) That's just, wow. Can you see why Peter would say, with the precious blood of Christ? Can you see why he would describe Jesus in, so, in such a loving and, and, and passionate and compassionate way? He was intensely intimate with, with Jesus himself. He talked with him. And he couldn't help but describe Jesus and the love that he had for him this way. And he thought Jesus was precious to him. The blood of Jesus was precious to him because it gave him a new lease on life. And it does the same for you and I. Amen? I remember long ago, (laughs) long ago, um, again, I don't think that I'm old, but I, when I was younger, when I was younger, um, when I first started to get to know Jesus. Of course, this is in the context of of lordship, of divine messiahship, okay? So the first time that I started to get to know Jesus, I was going through a really troublesome time in my life. Some of you know some of that story. Um, Was in and out of of bars and clubs and drugs and alcohol and, and you name it. And I realized that something had to change. Otherwise, my life was going to be uh, in shambles. And it already was, but I didn't want it to get worse. (laughs) And so I was willing at that point. It was, I was so far down. I was so, you know, they say at the, the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. I was, I couldn't go anywhere but up. Um. And my life looked bleak. It was, it was disastrous. And, and I decided, you know, I got to do something. And I looked at my father, my father, uh, Randy. He, his real name is James, but he goes by Randy. I looked at my dad, and he was different. I thought we were alike in so many different ways. He was, his life was essentially was the same as mine, except Something had shifted for him. Something had changed for him. He, he went from, you know, drugs and alcohol and, and all of those things to being a Christian. And I wasn't a Christian, obviously. I didn't have any relationship with Jesus, nor did I intend to have a relationship with Jesus. But when I was so far at the bottom of the barrel and I saw the life that my father was living, and how happy he was. I wanted that. I wanted that. And so I started to, started to talk with my father, my earthly father. I started to talk to him about what was going on with him. Like, um, I want this. I want to change. I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to uh, go from where I am now to where you are. And he pointed me to John, the book of John. And the first words that I read, again, this is the context of lordship, was, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
Of course, in verse, verse 14, he was manifest in the flesh, right? So I was, my mind is churning. The Holy Spirit is working with me, and I realized that this is Jesus, right? This is Jesus, who is God. That was a new concept for me. I mean, the whole thing was new, actually. <laughs> the whole thing was new. But the concept that Jesus is God was especially new to me. And so for the first time, praying in the darkness of my apartment, um, having just, you know, going through divorce and uh, all kinds of legal issues and losing my job and losing my friends and going through this, this you know, struggle in my life, trial, affliction. This was over 15 years ago, by the way. I spoke the word Lord for the first time in my life. And I was overwhelmed with emotion. I was overwhelmed with, with, with joy, and I wept. And it's okay to cry as a man. It's okay. I, as I understood in part what the Lord had already done for me as a sinner, right? I was brought to the text in my mind because I just started reading. I was brought to the text. While we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for the ungodly. For us, he died for you and for me. I knew he did that for me. I knew he did that for me. It was personal. And for Peter, it was personal. That's what these books are about. He's not just sharing doctrinal, you know, uh, principles, uh, theological truths. He's sharing his heart of who Jesus is to him with you, with me, with anybody that'll listen, with those that were scattered abroad in the dispersion, right? Pontius and Cappadocia and Asia and all of those places. This is who he's talking to, and he's going to talk about his friend. He's going to talk about someone that he admires, that he reveres, that he honors, that he, that he loves. He's going to talk about Jesus, who he worships, and who he praises. He made it personal. I made it personal, and I think we should make it personal. Get to know that Jesus, the same Jesus that Peter understood and Peter knew, and it takes time. Obviously, he didn't have a full understanding of who Jesus was when Jesus was in his midst. It wasn't until years later that he actually had a fuller grasp of who Jesus was, who the Messiah is, who he was as our sacrifice, as the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. He didn't understand that until later on. Peter struggles his sufferings and experiences with Jesus, the Christ, the divine Lord, helped shape his view of who the man Jesus was, who the divine Jesus is, and who he can, he, who he can be if he believed in him. I hope it is uh, your desire I, and it is mine to experience Jesus as our sacrifice. Jesus as the one who laid down his life for you and me. Make it personal. Jesus as our resurrection hope. He's already wrote your name as a reservation in heaven at the, the table and the wedding feast. Your reservation is there. You just got to show up. Jesus as our resurrection hope. Jesus as our divine Messiah this morning. I hope it is your desire that you experience Jesus this morning. May you be encircled by the presence of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, today. Amen. That is our lesson for this morning. And um, hope you were inspired and encouraged. And um, as I was as I as I was when studying. <laughs> um, I don't want to forget those of you who are listening in, tuning in via live stream or uh, online. Um, we do have the offer for you, offer number C21720, 
And uh, if you want a CD or DVD of this particular presentation, you can call us at 916-457-6511 or you can email us at csh at saccentral.org. Please include your full name and address so we know who to send it to. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.